Hello and welcome to Crossroads in Learning. I am your host, Keisha King. It is always a pleasure to join you on this platform. However, we are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic 2020. In fact, we are nearing the middle of April and we are facing numbers of over 20,000 lives lost due to this pandemic. Our hope is that we can flatten that line and that we will see a decrease in the numbers of those affected by this disease. But we haven't so far, and in fact, the numbers that we are continuing to receive are shocking and most alarming. We are faced with realizing now that over 60% of the deaths that have happened during this pandemic are of people of color. African Americans and Latinos and others are dying at alarming numbers. And it is not a genetic problem. It is not uh, an alcohol or drug problem, or it's not induced because of anything other than the fact that healthcare in America is not what it should be. And that is due to policies, that is due to prices on your basic needs, and perhaps in some ways, due to challenges in the education and the systems that pertain to healthcare. Mentioning education, we also want to state that we have plenty of people who are on the front lines. I'm so proud to say that we have doctors and nurses who are on the front lines caring for those who have COVID-19 and have been affected in some way because of it. But they are not the only people who are on the front lines. In fact, today on our show, we have people who are the literal boots on the ground. We have educators and an activist working daily to make a difference in the lives of ordinary folks, just like you and I. So please welcome with me my three guests for today. We have Pastor Michael McBride, the pastor of The Way Church and Live Free uh, Faith in Action campaign. We have uh, Derek Govin, who is an educator right here in Honolulu, Hawaii, at the Department of Education. And we have wonderful Ms. Lindsay Robertson, also an educator in special ed right here in Honolulu, Hawaii. All three of my guests, it's an honor to have you. Welcome to The Crossroads. Great to be here. Great to be here. Thank you, Keisha. So, Indeed, indeed. So I'm just going to jump right in and say I was thoroughly surprised and saddened that the death rate has been what it has been for all people all across the country and all throughout the world. But being of African-American descent, I am also alarmed by the number of African-Americans and people of color in general who have been diagnosed and have passed away. Initially, when we were going to go on the air, it was 50%. As of today, I've gotten statistics that say it's 60% of the 26,000 people are of people of color. So Pastor Mike, I'm going to turn right into you and say, what in the world do you think of that? Well, I think, uh, first off, I'm great, grateful to be here with you. Um, and be able to talk about this uh, with all your listeners and comrades and loved ones in uh, Hawaii. I've not been to Hawaii yet, so I guess I got to make a trip <laughs> once we can get back flying. Um, but but no, the 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 impact of COVID um, nineteen coronavirus um, has been devastating. It is indeed a expression of the already underlying inequities, um, the underlying. Um, uh, vestiges of, of, of human hierarchy, racism, uh, discrimination, exclusion uh, that black communities, brown communities, indigenous communities um, have felt for quite some time. Um, this crisis is sitting down heavily in our communities for, I would say, several reasons. The first reason I mentioned already is racism. Um, and it is a expression of racism around the way that race plus power has coalesced to decide how resources are meted out to people 
over the last couple of decades. We know that in states with Republican governors, they have uh, intentionally uh, withheld Obamacare dollars and opting into Obamacare. So the cause then has been hospitals shutting down. Uh, people do not have access to health care, access to preventive care. So the underlying conditions that are a result of lack of access to health care, food deserts, um, the daily stress of just being in an anti-Black, anti-Brown uh, uh, society uh, has really allowed this virus, which was already lethal and deadly, to become a pandemic of epic proportions disproportionately borne out in Black communities. And so it is indeed a great, great tragedy. Many of our communities were already dealing with a catastrophe. Now we have a literal tragedy on our hands and it is gonna be up to people of goodwill uh, to do all we can to reverse through targeted interventions, the kinds of impacts that we're seeing all across the country. I couldn't agree with you more. And I want to bring Liz, Lindsay and Derek into this conversation. But before I do, I want to say that, you know, I was watching, I believe it was Roland Martin and a guest of his who said, this is an epidemic within the pandemic that has been going on forever. So the ideas behind systemic racism as it pertains to healthcare is not new. That was an epidemic that was going on and being overshadowed and overlooked and undercared for. And now it's just being magnetized by the pandemic that we know of as COVID-19. On another note, however, I'll say, Derek, Lindsay, you are on the front lines on the education front. We are now faced with children having been out of school here in the state for a few weeks now going into a month, and it's happening all across the country. Teachers are now feeling, from what I've heard, there's a sense of adventure because they have a new challenge. But Lindsay, some teachers are feeling overwhelmed. Can you tell us what tactics regarding self-care have you implemented yourself and shared with others to help them so that they can make it through? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Keisha, uh, for having me, of course. Um, so I'm a huge advocate for uh, self-care and mental health, especially for uh, teachers, especially during this time. It's a difficult time for, you know, all of us as educators uh, to kind of flip the whole script of how we traditionally teach in the classroom and navigating that has been very difficult. Um, I will say um, one thing that is important, I think, is uh, following a routine and a structure. Um, obviously, when we are in the traditional classroom, uh, we thrive off of routine and structure. And um, when we work from home, we can also create that routine and structure. And I think within that routine and structure, it's also important to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and your body, uh, making sure that you're eating right, you're drinking enough water, um, I'm also a huge advocate for exercise and getting outdoors, um, obviously with taking the proper safety precautions, um, such as wearing a mask and maintaining that social distancing. Um, I think that those are important things. Some um, resources that I've actually used since uh, this whole pandemic has begun and since we've been out of school, um, there have been several uh, live uh, workout classes that actually have been taking place virtually. So it's nice to tune in there and get your home workout or go into your backyard and get some fresh air. Of course, go out and take a quick walk around the neighborhood is always good. And then also, I think it's important that you're also centered within yourself um, through meditation, uh, things like that, I think are important to keep yourself grounded during this very difficult time. Thank you so much. So we have various tactics that we can use that do not require a doctor, do not require prescriptions. Your gym doesn't have to be open and it isn't anyway. So you have to do things on your own. And, <laughs> yeah. and in fact, we are all forced with doing things alone and on our own and in our houses. I had a meeting this week where I said, man, I hardly ever see you guys outside of my office. And now here you are in my living room. So I'll talk, address that, you know, it's like you're up close and personal in my space, you know. Um, but Eric, I wanna talk to you because you found a way to help teachers, to help your colleagues 
collaborate in the midst of this, what some consider isolation. And I want to talk because uh, using that word kind of makes me cringe because this is not isolation. This is not lockdown. We're going to talk about prisons. And in fact, I'm going to talk more to uh, Pastor Mike, as he is called affectionately, Pastor Mike. Uh, we're going to talk to him about what is really lockdown and, and solitary confinement. This is not it, but we want to address that and what you're doing to help that. But Govin, we want to touch with you. I call you affectionately, by the way. But we want to talk with you about how have you been able to collaborate in the midst of what we are doing this social distancing. Sure. Thank you, Keisha. And again, thank you for having me. This is, uh, this is nice. Um, so there's two parts. So it's about collaborating, how we're collaborating with our parents and how we're collaborating as teachers and professionals. How are we um, empowering each other and supporting each other during this time to support us during this time? Because it is challenging. Um, and what we found most often was our parents needed a sense uh, and support to get a sense of normalcy and get a sense of routine. So same like Lindsay was saying for us as well. Um, our kids need that and we are serving students with special needs, some with severe special needs, and they need that normalcy and they need that routine. And so when we think about being told to stay in our homes and being told to do virtual sessions with our kids and support them from home, we start to think, gosh, this is really hard. How can I do this? But I found that when we put our teachers together and give and be solutions oriented, uh, teachers have it in them to to be the change agents, to really um, come up with outside of the ideas, uh, come up with ideas outside of the box and to come up right. with these beautiful things and share resources amongst each other where they can support each other and they can support their teachers um, in their schools and support the students at home as much as they possibly can. Good deal. Now, you know, when I talk about education, I did my master's uh, dissertation on the um, school to prison pipeline. And I talked about how a disproportionate number of African American boys were diagnosed with special needs. And if you were in third grade and you couldn't read very well, and Pastor Mike, I'm coming to you with this because it, it says if you couldn't read very well and you got into a fight and were suspended from school in third grade, essentially they built a prison cell with your name or number on it. And so that was when I found out that statistic, I was devastated. I have a young boy who, at the time I was writing this uh, dissertation, and he was young enough to have been in third grade. Now my son was actually graduated high school with a 4.6 GPA, so he could read very well. This is not him, but not everybody fits that bill. And it was devastating to find out that that was actually how they did it, okay? How they determined how many jails to build. build. And what it seems like to me, and I could be wrong, was that they put our young men in jail and forgot about them. Case in point, here we are in 2020 with a pandemic that says stay away from each other in order not to get it. And you cannot do that in any jail that I've ever seen on TV or in person, okay? You can't stay away from someone six feet apart. And in most jails, there's no pump for, yeah, I have a pump right here at my house at the front door, okay? No one's coming to visit, but should they come, I have sanitizer. They don't have that in jail and they hardly have enough soap. How can they keep away from each other? Okay, and not get this. And does our government even care? So Pastor Mike, I want to address that to you. What are your thoughts on that? How should they, or is it even possible they protect themselves? And what are you doing about it? Yeah, well, it, it, it is a great question. And it, it displays the kind of moral drift that our country, and dare I say, um, you know, the society has. The scriptures that I follow talk about that we will be judged by um, the way we treat our widows and orphans and those who are in jail. Will we visit them? Will we care for them? In a pandemic, no one should be deemed disposable. Um, we should not be picking and choosing whose lives are valuable to save. And so 
Mass for the People, which is an initiative of the Live Free campaign, um, is so, so blessed. We were just awarded a $1 million gift from Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, um, to help yes, us. Yes, and I wanted to, to get to tour. that. I, I have to cut you off because I <laughs> wanted to kind of give a lead into that, but I'll just say it now. <laughs> <laughs> that you did have a very special announcement today. You had a very special guest that was on. Uh, my Facebook Live is where I saw it with you today. And that announcement was something that 10 days ago was a dream, a thought, an idea in your mind. And now here we are 10 days later with $1 million. So please tell One us the idea. Million, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, $1 yes, yes. billion. And, dollars. and, and the and, connections and what, are out of this world. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I'll just say, you know, that we had a vision that I think was like a bolt of lightning just, 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 just zinged us because we were hearing these stories about people in jails and prisons, prisons and, and uh, soap was being rationed to them, if not withheld. Certainly, uh, medical care was being withheld. People were dying in the prison cells next to their uh, their cellmates and being left in the bed um, unattended to already expired. They would take the bodies and dump them outside in, in the courtyard in a tent. This is the way our loved ones who are incarcerated were being treated. We had loved ones, other frontline workers who did not work in hospitals, but maybe uh, drove buses, maybe were uh, outreach workers in urban neighborhoods interrupting violence, or they were serving food to kids, all being sick because they didn't have masks. Now we recently just saw some loved ones in Philadelphia being pulled off the bus physically by a police officer because they don't have masks. So we're seeing that there are certain parts of our country and our community who are not over, who are not only over uh, diagnosed and dying from this illness, but they are also being rationed and and if not um, uh, eliminated from the equation of care. So this one million dollars will help us be able to buy hundreds of thousands of masks that we can give away free to folks mm -hmm. in urban communities, rural communities that have mm -hmm. experienced um, a dearth of resources. We're going to be in Detroit, Milwaukee, Chicago, New Orleans, Columbus, Newark, Orlando, Tampa, Los Angeles, Oakland, Dallas, Birmingham, just to name a few. And this million dollars is uh, going to go right. a long way in being able to help us get this stuff out, mask and sanitizer, so our folks can have some preventive care and slow down the, vi right. the, the spread of this virus and uh, hopefully give the country and the medical uh, uh, doctors and others a chance to catch up to the care needed to um, hopefully save as many lives as we can. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And and I'm hoping that we we can keep raising more. If you wanna donate, you can go to livefreeusa.org, livefreeusa.org, and uh, just donate uh, $5, $10, $25, $100, whatever you can give. A little bit adds up to a lot, and uh, prayerfully, you know, the the gift that Jack has given. Kamal Bell said he's now going to launch a billionaire challenge. He's gonna he's gonna call on all the billionaires uh, that uh, are out there that uh, want to help respond in a humanitarian effort to this crisis to donate to Mass for the People or other organizations like this to help us be able to address these issues. But I lost you guys for a minute. I had to reboot. You are amazing. Ten days ago, this didn't exist. This didn't, this wasn't going on. And now here we are. Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter. And what's the other uh, he's CEO of? Square. Um, Square. We all use both. And so he has donated very generously. One million dollars, and I must say that I found this out through Kamal Bell, who I follow on Twitter. And uh, well, I didn't find it out before it happened. I just follow you both, and you both posted that you had a special announcement to make today. So I was 
thrilled when I found out that this was happening. And this is what we're talking about, people, boots on the ground. Now, today during your live announcement, you had a guest and you just called her, I think it was Miss Queen, which I have to tell you, that's what they call me, okay? AIE, <laughs> 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 they call me Queen. And um, she said that she almost she heard that, I think it was Detroit was one in five, right? Uh, talking about the deaths. And then she said one in 10 and or 10 of every- One in seven. It was one, one in seven, seven in New Orleans. Yeah, or in right. Louisiana, yeah. And I just thought, my goodness, that's horrible. And so, you know, you cannot, you cannot underestimate how tragic this is. Um, you know, I read a story today of a woman who lost her entire family in one week due to this virus. So what you're doing, Pastor Mike, is so necessary. You know, when I know these communities, Okay, I know that it's extremely hard for them to for your average family who live in an average community and they are getting they have stores like Family Dollar, Dollar General. They have to drive away before they get to a major store like Walmart and a specialty store that has these items is even further away. But Dollar General. Uh, family Dollar, they ran out of masks and gloves and hand sanitizer a long time ago, and they just mm -hmm. don't have it. And so for someone to be dragged off the bus because they didn't have it, because they didn't have access to it, it's more than just a little bit unfair. It's almost inhumane. And right. yet it's <laughs> So what you're doing needs to be applauded, needs to be recognized. And after you made your announcement, this is the first place you came. <laughs> I yep, know this yep, you, you, you got my immediate reaction. I'm on cloud nine. I think I can be like Jesus tonight and walk on some water somewhere. <laughs> you know, this is a good time to compare yourself to Jesus. But what I've heard is a lot of people compare you to uh, a young Martin Luther King. And I've heard oh. this, well, and indeed that is a compliment, but I've heard this because not just this, this is not your first walk in the park, so to speak. Uh, you've also done a lot with gun violence in your state and you've worked with gangs. Can you talk to us a little bit about that work? Because that's been going on for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Live Free campaign um, was launched in 1999 um, as a response to urban gun violence and mass incarceration. Um, when I was actually a youth pastor back in 1999, um, you know, I, I was physically and sexually assaulted by some cops. And I had a lot of young people in my congregation who were saying this happened to them all of the time. And uh, the young people said, you know, we just didn't think, Pastor Mike, we could bring this part of our life to the church and it would be addressed. And, and I heard God just kind of challenge me, what is it about my ministry that I can uh, be trusted with the saving of their souls, but not the protection of their bodies? Um, from that point on, we began to really build out um, a, a series of interventions around gun violence. Less than half of 1% of your city's population will drive almost 60% of the gun-related shootings and homicides. So what we started to do, we built off of some models that came out of Boston and Chicago, and we just do everything we can to engage the less than half of 1% of those uh, gun um, offenders and victims and perpetrators, uh, because we often find that there is a false line of distinction between a victim and a perpetrator. Depending on when you come into the life of a young person, they may be a victim or a perpetrator of gun violence, but they always need healing and they always need some love and some and some support. And so um, thankfully we've been able to scale this up in Oakland and in Richmond, California, Stockton, California, Detroit, Michigan, Newark, New Jersey, um, uh, Chicago, Illinois, Detroit, a number of different cities, Birmingham and Baton Rouge. And we have seen in at least half of those cities, a 30% drop on the low end, uh, a 70% drop on the high end within 18 months, which just means that some of our cities had 100 gun-related shootings one year and after our work, 
that drop to as low as 50 shootings and homicides in one year. It's a public health approach. We believe that you get out into the neighborhoods, you love on folks, you help folks, you give them some some strong, uh, you know, sometimes you got to give folks a timeout. You got to give them, you know, that 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 strong push to, to change and get off that trajectory. But I love our people. I love those who find themselves caught in these cycles. If you love them, oftentimes they'll get right off that ramp. And thanks be to God, for the last 10 years, we've been able to cut gun violence in a lot of cities across the country without sending people to jail. And uh, for us, right. um, you know, being able to do both at the same time is a great, great, a testament to the work of both those who are caught in violence and those who are doing the peacemaking work on the ground. That's right. It's about building relationships. And when you have a relationship with someone, if they like you enough, they'll listen and they are Absolutely. then willing to change their behaviors. But if you don't build those relationships, there won't be change. They're not willing to change their behavior simply because you've asked them to or you've made the statement for them regarding that. You all know that as educators on the front line. If you build relationships with children, your students, and with colleagues, then you start to have the ability to affect change. Why don't you address that a little bit uh, as you see it in your line of work, either Lindsay or Derek? Derek, you I'll have a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. I'll let, I'll let Lindsay uh, go on that part. I just wanted to give you a shout out and just really, it's an awesome testament to the work you're doing, uh, Pastor. I, I find it very inspirational and being from Southwest Virginia, hence the Southern accent that comes hey. out when I get nervous. Yeah. So, um, but being from Southwest Virginia, being a white man and learning more as I age and learning more of my privilege and not understanding even the half of my privilege. Now I have to tell you, I'm very inspired by the work you're doing. Um, and I think a call to action for um, not only the African-American population to support the people of color, but us as, as white individuals, especially the white men. How do we make change and how do we, how are we to become change agents for, um, for our people of color and supporting our inequities and, um, or our changing inequity, doing what we need to do for our society. I just, hats off to you. This is amazing work. Thank you. Thank you, dear brother. And, and, and yeah. We need everybody to get in this this fight for liberation and freedom. As Dr. King says, what affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. And uh, we are all caught in an inescapable mutual network. And, uh, you know, quiet as it's kept, many, many more of our uh, white brothers and sisters um, are incarcerated and caught up in um, addiction and drugs that lead to death and, um, and suicides. And so we got a lot of mutual work to do. Um, but I certainly appreciate the opportunity to partner with people of goodwill from all across uh, the lines of difference. Um, this is one creation, one world we have been gifted, and may we steward it all together in love and solidarity. That's right. Just great. I, love yes, thank I you agree. Me. Yeah. No, thank you too, um, Pastor Mike. I appreciate it. And it's actually very, like Derek said, very inspiring to listen. Um, to you know these statistics and how you're addressing um, you know this pandemic and other uh, things that are going on within the world, um, but Keisha, in terms of your um, question regarding relationships, I would agree. I think that building relationships and rapport is the number one thing in order to get um, anything out of you know anyone. Um, so like, for example, within the education world, um, I've been, I've only been a teacher for about three years. I've been at my school that I'm currently at for two. Um, but last year was my first year at the high school level teaching students with disabilities. And I knew the minute I walked in the classroom door that I was gonna have to build rapport with my students in order to get them to be able to learn. You need to love on students and love on all individuals like Pastor Mike said, I agree, until you can get them to listen and to comply with what you're asking. And I think that those relationships are what are going to keep us strong, especially during this time as well. Thank you so much. It is about relationships. And, you know, Mr. Mike, I have to thank you. I thank you for the work that you've been doing. You know, you said since 1999. And, you know, I have... Um, reflected in a previous show about what was going on in 1999.
Back mm. in 1999, uh, you two were babies, but <laughs> the rest of us were so scared about Y2K. You remember that, Mr. Mike? We That's thought right. Absolutely. The clock, right? The clock was going to wind down and what was going to happen. <laughs> the banks, the, the money was going to be gone. And, you know, we were petrified. And we thought, yeah. what is the world going to be like? We had no idea. And yet when it happened, you know, because most people, I won't say maybe Pastor Mike wasn't, and I'm an angel, so I wasn't partying, but most people were out partying <laughs> <laughs> and nothing happened. Nothing happened. It was, it just rolled right into the next year and it was pretty flawless. And here we are 20 years later at the turn of a new decade, a hundred and some years after a different type of pandemic happened, Spanish mm. flu. And, yeah. you know, that goes to tell you that if you don't know your history, you're likely to repeat it. So we faced yeah. that pandemic nearly a hundred years ago. The racism that we're talking about, that systemic was put in place over a hundred years ago, and it's still going on. So, you know, Pastor Mike, we're about to close, but I wonder if you have any words of encouragement so that people can know that I know scripture. I went to seminary as well. The scripture says, you know, we talk about lack of knowledge, right? And without knowledge, people will perish. Can you give us some tidbits of information or encouragement that would enlighten the hearts and minds of people so that we don't repeat this again? We don't want to go through this again, all of it. Can you help us yeah. out with that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just be glad to just say, you know, we are, um, for all of us who are Christians, we are just coming out of Easter. If you're Jewish, you're in a Passover season. If you are Muslim, you are, uh, you know, heading into Ramadan real soon. Um, and if you are just a humanist or a, a agnostic, um, you, you appreciate that there's a through line around just moral, uh, compassionate, um, but also faithful stewardship or care of the earth, of everything that is created. So I just want us to always remember um, that uh, it is our responsibility to care for one another. Um, it's our responsibility to not be ahistorical about the struggles that uh, have gone before us. It's also our responsibility to remember, uh, as Jesus said, um, that he has overcome the world. And so since God has overcome the world, so then can we overcome the world? That we are a people um, on this kind of uh, day after resurrection, we can live as resurrected people, people with new eyes, new imagination, a new politic, a new economy, a new set of relationships. We don't have to go back to a normal that was literally abnormal. We can actually craft and forge a world. Uh, the, the, the prophet said, I see a new heaven and a new earth. Um, that we don't have to wait until we die to see a new heaven and a new earth. We can create heaven right here on this earth. And that looks like uh, a guaranteed basic income. That looks like our ability to make sure everyone has food and shelter and clothing. That this world created with abundance and enough can be shared equally among all who inhabit it. So I just compel all of us, love justice, do mercy, walk humbly with God and all creation. Let's keep doing what we know needs to be done to eliminate all of these uh, systemic and structural evils that afflict the soul, the mind, and the body. Stay strong, be encouraged, uh, love yourself, love your neighbor, love all that has been created and know that it is through our love uh, that we can cover a multitude of mistakes, challenges, and problems love in will always win. You hit on many key points. The number one being love, love. I love what you're doing, Pastor Mike. Please keep it up. The world needs you. I love what you're doing, Lindsay. I love what you're doing, Derek. Our students need you in the classroom. As I said earlier on, these are boots on the ground. You're doing the work. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Congratulations, Pastor Mike. One million dollars. One million dollars. <laughs>
God bless. Can't wait to come to Honolulu or Hawaii, wherever we are. <laughs> yes, we are currently in Honolulu, downtown Honolulu, where all the views are beautiful, but we just can't go through them right now. Yeah. So yeah. hang in there. We will come back. We'll bounce back and, and get it, be able to enjoy all of the creation. So hang in there, shelter in place, stay home so we can get, get, get out sooner. That's right. All right. Yeah. You've been watching Crossroads and Learning. I have been your host, Keisha King, and we will see you next time at the Crossroads. Aloha.